Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 20 years of law enforcement analysis experience, with most of her years supporting the great state of North Carolina. She is a subject matter expert with iDallas DDAX program and currently a senior manager in the fraud and crime analysis team for LexisNexis. Please welcome Lauren Norman. Lauren, how are we doing? I'm good, Jason. How are you? I am doing very well. Thank you for joining me. I'm excited. So how did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? I fell into it, (laughs) you know, just like many of us did when I was in college, getting my undergraduate degree, I majored in psychology and towards the end, finishing it up, I started to develop an interest in criminal justice and law enforcement. And I started to work in the district attorney's office where I was going to college in Wilmington, North Carolina. I just started to develop this passion for law enforcement, but I really had no idea what I was going to do. I knew that I didn't really want to you know, put my hands on anyone. So being a a police officer didn't really appeal to me. And I took one of my last courses and my professor, he talked about crime analysis. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. And not soon after graduation, um, I relocated to Raleigh, North Carolina, and there was a job posting for the Raleigh Police Department for a crime analyst. And I was like, uh, I'm not qualified for this, but I'm going to apply anyway. And I did. And they actually picked me and brought me in for an interview. I knew a little bit, but I didn't know a great deal. I was asked to look at some data while I was there. It was a you know pretty traditional crime analysis process. I was asked to make a map with ARC, which I could not do, but I was given this data. That it was like an Excel spreadsheet that had been printed out of a burglary robbery pattern. And I was asked to sort of go through it and make some conclusions across the room uh, that I was sitting in. They left me alone for 15 minutes. There was a couple of highlighters and I got up and I went and got those highlighters and I came back and I just went through with the different colors and marked the patterns. You know, a week or so later I was called and, and they gave me the opportunity. And when I first started, the Lieutenant that did the hiring process told me he hired me because I went and got that cup of highlighters and I went through that Excel spreadsheet and I identified the patterns and I color coded them. And so he saw in me that I had the intuition to do that. And that's how I got my first job. And I loved it. It was a natural fit for me. And that's what I've done for the last 20 years. Very interesting. So how many other interviewer E's were there? Do you remember? I honestly, I don't know. Um, okay. You know, they brought brought me in individually. So, sure. I, and I never asked. I was just so thrilled to, you know, to get that opportunity and that he saw something in me and it has led to my, my life's work. And so. So did he put those highlighters there on purpose in the room? Honestly, I, I really don't think so. I was in the comp stat room. That's where we were doing the interview. And mm-hmm. I actually think that that cup of highlighters belong to Stacy Joyner, who is a, he's still a crime analyst. He actually works with me today at LexisNexis, but I was essentially in his comp stat office and I think they were his and I just borrowed them. Um, so thanks, Stacy. <laughs> uh, that's you know, thinking outside of the box and that helped me get my first job. And I always um, have remembered that, uh, what the Lieutenant, Lieutenant Law was his name, um, what he did for me and given me that opportunity. And I try to sort of carry that forward now as a person that's in a position to hire individuals for entry-level crime analysis positions. I look for that in people that I'm interviewing as well. So So then you're starting and you're very green. So what's the first month like for you? 
Very interesting. My father was a police officer, so I grew up knowing about the, the police department, going to the police department with him when I was a, a child, but I lived in a very small town. You know, obviously the Raleigh Police Department's the state capital here in North Carolina. Huge, a lot of officers, investigators, a lot of big crimes, a lot of big series. So my eyes were wide open as I was learning there were some ladies that had been lifelong employees of the police department that when they developed the crime analysis unit, they were moved into that unit and they really took me under their wing and they helped me out and taught me a great deal about how to query data and how to use access databases. And if it hadn't been for them really accepting me, taking me into the fold and teaching me, I don't know that I'd be where I am today, but I, I learned a lot. I, I jumped right in. I was super excited to learn and it paid off. What are your tasks when you first start? For me, it was really learning the geography of the city of Raleigh. I mean, it's such a large place and I was working assigned in a district that I had no clue about. I didn't know street names. I didn't know major locations. That's a big important thing to really know the area that you're working in. I really had to immerse myself in my district in the city of Raleigh. And then, of course, learning all about UCR and, you know, how we were going to look and classify things and how we wanted to report things. And uh, we did comp stat and we did traditional comp stat. The chief of police at the time came from NYPD. Her name was Jane Perlov. She was an amazing chief. I, I enjoyed working with her so much. So, you know, I had to get ready for comp stat and I had to learn what I needed to help provide for my district so that we could be prepared for comp stat so that, you know, you get hit with so much and you start to use excel in different ways than you never did in college and you, you know, start to explore different databases and really dig into the records management system and the calls for service data and make it your own. And that, that's exactly what I did. So where were you stationed? What department were you in? Patrol, investigations, IT? So I sort of walked the line between investigations and patrol. I was assigned to a district and each district had, you know, obviously their, their patrol squads, but each district also had its own assigned detective division. So I worked with both very closely. I did the comp stat numbers and really helped prepare my district's command staff for our all city comp stat reports. And then I worked with the investigators on patterns and trends. Did you eventually switch to a different district or did you stay in that same district the whole time you were with Raleigh? Yeah, I stayed in my district the almost five years that I was there. I worked in one district. I loved my district. It was the District 26. We were numbers then. They've since changed the names, but there were two universities that sat in my district and then, you know, a, a variety of commercial businesses, residential neighborhoods. I mean, it was a, a large jurisdiction with a lot of different stuff going on. So I sort of got a taste of working all different types of crime patterns and trends and got to witness firsthand a lot of different types of investigations going on. It was a great place to start a career in crime analysis. Since you had two universities in your district, I can guess that your theft from auto numbers were pretty high. We had a lot of that. <laughs> uh, you know, we had a lot of loud party, noise type activity like that. But you, typical college stuff, a lot of, you know, off-campus housing was broken into. Um, a lot of uh, like small drug activity things were going on. But yeah, absolutely. We had our fair share of motor vehicles being stolen. When did you have the first sense that you were getting buy-in since you were so new, so green? When did you get the sense that this is the first time that things are clicking? So, you know, buy-in is so important for us in the analytical world. You know, we, we're looking at things a little bit differently. And for me, just like you know, many others that I've met throughout my career, this was my first job. I, I went in and people were a little apprehensive. Got to get that buy-in. You've got to get people's trust. And being right out of college, you know, sort of bebopping in and saying, here's my report and, you know, here's what I found. And some people can be dismissive. And 
I did encounter that in the very beginning, but I remember we had a pattern that was occurring over and over again. I remember the address or the street, it was National Drive. Every five weeks, we would have break-ins and it was a large business complex. So, you know, it was like six or seven buildings. And if you got into the building, you had access to real estate offices, attorney's offices, whoever was leasing an office in this complex. And every five weeks, we would have a series of break-ins. The first two or three occurrences that it happened, I was like, mm, they're, like there's something here. We got a couple of surveillance images. I was like, this is the same person. And I would put my bulletin together. I would send it out. And at the five-week mark, I would see them come in again. So I had gone to the very first alpha group class and I learned the old school way of doing the predictions and making my prediction zones, timing it out, using the graph paper, using the calendar. And so I sat down and I did that. I went through the whole process. I put together this really nice bulletin that said, this guy is going to hit again and it's going to happen Saturday night between this time range. And I went to the sergeant that was working night shift and said, hey, can we have someone sit in the parking lot? And he dismissed me. And he was like, no, I don't think it's going to happen again. He was like, you don't know what you're doing. Mm. But I sent the bulletin out anyway this time. And I sent it to everyone. And it happened. And I came into work on Monday. And the chief saw my bulletin. And she wanted to know why no one was sitting in that parking lot during the time that I had predicted that these <laughs> burglaries were going to happen. And no one really had a good answer for her. So <laughs> I got the buy-in from the chief. She made a prediction, the crimes happened, like, why aren't we using this data that she's providing, these maps, this, this projection analysis? You can bet that the, you know, five weeks later, <laughs> we had guys in a van sitting in that parking lot waiting, and we finally got our guy. So that was my first experience of like really getting someone in my corner, paying attention to the work that I was doing and sort of validating it and saying hey, we really need to be looking at this and using it. And so that was that was awesome. And so then that helped me get the buy-in and that led to people coming in the office, sitting down, talking to me. Hey, what's going on? What are you seeing? What's the data say? And that just sort of took off from there. Nice. So were you able to forecast it the second time? And is that how you caught them? Yep. Yeah. Wow. He, he, had so, a, he had a pattern, you know, and, and most criminals do. And I, I figured out his pattern. So we got him. <laughs> It was exactly five weeks every time? Yeah, I'm, I'm not oh. sure. I, you know, we never really could figure out the five-week thing, okay. like what it was with him. If he was maybe hitting other places, you know, maybe he went to other towns and did it because we didn't have the same pattern in the city. And we never found another pattern. Like no one, when we, you know, discussed it at regional meetings, no one popped up and said, hey, but he could have been from out of state 20 some years ago. We didn't really reach out so much across state lines. But yeah, he he had a distinct pattern and I figured it out. I got some buy-in, which was awesome, especially when it comes from the chief. <laughs> nice. And so from there, is this where you go on to North Carolina State? So I made a pit stop at the Chapel Hill Police Department, which is just down the road from Raleigh. So I was there for about a year. And then I had the opportunity to go over to the North Carolina State Bureau. And that's, okay. that's where I went. Why the leap from Raleigh and then the leap to the state? You know, just something different. I really, you know, I, I did. I loved Raleigh, but I also met my husband while I was working at the Raleigh Police Department and we did not want to work together. And so it was much easier <laughs> for to get a, a, seek another opportunity than it was for him. And I don't regret that one bit. We happily married. We've been married for over 11 years now. So I decided that this was the man that I wanted to be with. I wanted to marry. I did not want to work with. So I saw another opportunity and I did, I made a pit stop at the Chapel Hill Police Department, but that became a, just a really long drive for me. And, you know, it was, it was taking me a, almost two hours to get to work every day and then two hours to get back home with traffic. So I was fortunate to get the opportunity to go over to the State Bureau and I worked in the Criminal Intelligence Division there uh, and I specialized in homicide and violent crimes for uh, the entire state. Uh, I wasn't assigned a district, I, I covered the entire state. 
so then you're switching from more of a crime analysis role into an intelligence analyst role. I did. So how was that transition for you? That was, you know, it's interesting. There are, to me, there's still a lot of parallels in the field of analysis. You know, we do sort of put those titles like traditional crime analysis, you know, doing tactical analysis, doing investigative analysis, doing administrative analysis. And even with that switch in title to an intelligence analyst, I still had those components of doing some administrative things and doing some tactical things. It's more of just a, a matter of how we phrase it. But I did enjoy starting to sort of tap into that investigative side of things, you know, essentially working as a, a, a non-sworn investigator with these agents on these major crimes and getting a whole new perspective into large-scale investigations, things like OSADEF cases and RICO cases that you don't necessarily get to experience when you're working at a local police department. So I really enjoyed that transition and, and really starting to dig in and make connections, you know, non-obvious connections between people and places and things and really get involved in those major case investigations and, and help support them and put bad people in jail. All right. So this leads us to your badge story, then your analyst badge story. And for those that may be new to the show, the analyst badge story is the case or project that is the career defining moment for the analyst. For you, as you're working on these homicides, these get into your bad stories. Yeah. So, you know, for me, so, you know, switching gears and going into working on homicides and focusing on violent crime, that's it's very difficult. These are some of the worst cases to see the crime scene photos, to visit the crime scene if you happen to be on site, and to just start digging into the details of individuals' lives to try and do the victimology side of it, as well as identify information on these suspects. We had a case that made national news in 2008. There was a young lady by the name of Eve Carson. She was the student body president at the uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She was a beautiful young lady with such a bright future ahead of her. She was kidnapped from her home. She lived off campus. Two individuals walked through, saw her, saw that she was alone. They, they went into the home. They kidnapped her, forced her to take money out of an ATM, and ultimately they murdered her. I was in my transition from the Chapel Hill Police Department to the State Bureau when that homicide occurred. And so I was there the morning that you know, she was located. And so I worked that case from the very beginning at the police department. And then as it transitioned over and my career transitioned over, the case sort of stayed with me had to do, you know, mapping, tracing. We did a lot of phone detail analysis to help locate these individuals. But it was also the first case that I ever worked where I, with the investigators, you know, I went to memorial services and I was involved when the family came in and, and we had the opportunity to, to speak with them. And so it really sort of hits home. And I actually still have Eve's picture on my desk. I keep it on my desk as a reminder of, you know, this is why we found these guys. We did, you know, a lot of cell phone analysis. I did a lot of call detail record analysis to try and help with locations and cell phone pings. We found these guys. I went through so many Crime Stoppers tips and we, you know, we had some surveillance images. They were identified. They were arrested. They are spending the rest of their lives in jail. But I keep her picture just to remind me, like, this is, you know, why I'm still in this career to help bring justice to those families. I know that, you know, that never replaces someone that's lost. But just knowing that we were able to resolve that case for the family, th that definitely has impacted me and stayed with me. And as my first sort of big major case that I ever worked on. Yeah, I, you know, I remember it, I think about it, and I, I keep that picture there just to remind me, this is why I'm still doing what we're doing. That's fascinating that it was just that right time when you were transitioning from Chapel Hill to the state, and you were yeah. able to keep that case with you and see it all the way through. Yeah, it was odd timing, but, you know, I, I got to work with 
the investigators that I had been working with at the police department. And then I met my new coworkers who were some of the agents for the SBI because they came in to assist and it just naturally happened that way. Now was the surveillance photos from what, the ATM? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, was, when you first said that, when you said that and forced her to get out money, that was the first thing that I went to. I was like, oh, I bet you there's ATM surveillance. Right. And, okay. and you know, thank, thank goodness that there was. That definitely helped as I was going through the Crime Stoppers tips that were rolling in. We kept seeing a couple that were the same. And, you know, the public's response to that was was amazing and definitely helped in the identification and securing, making sure we had the right people. Yeah. Ultimately, one of them actually was responsible for another homicide that had mm. occurred a few months earlier of a college student in the next city over, and we got his DNA. They were able to solve that case, too. So Okay, good. So then with the state, then when does the state get involved in local cases? What was the criteria? So the state uh, in North Carolina, they have original jurisdiction over a few things, you know, drug investigations, arson investigations, bomb threats, things like that. But any local uh, law enforcement agency here can request their assistance. So if it's a small agency that doesn't have a lot of resources, they can call the SBI and request, will you please help us? And you know, the agents will work along with them to do the investigation. And so then they get access to the unit that I was working in, the criminal intelligence unit. And that's where we help with getting subpoenas out so we can get some of those cell phone records and really digging into the backgrounds of individuals to help paint that comprehensive profile of, of what you might be dealing with. So I know every state's differently, but that's how we're structured here. It's a great relationship to have that the large state agency has your back if you're a small agency and you need some additional support and resources. Okay. And then you eventually move on to Gardner Police Garner. Department. Gardner. Sorry. <laughs> Clearly says Gardner and I said Gardner. Where is Gardner? So Gardner is, is right here. It, you know, it's another little suburb town of Raleigh. I, you know, working at the SBI, working on homicides and violent crime for, for all of those years, I was on call for what, four years straight, my phone rang on weekends and at nights. And I just, I got tired and mm -hmm. I was looking, I wanted to maybe transition a little bit and get back to my crime analysis roots. I had worked a, a couple of pretty horrible cases towards the end. And I, I started to look for a change. This opportunity came up. It was a, a grant position to implement DDACs and I didn't really know what DDAX was. I started researching it, started learning about it. And I was like, you know what? I can, uh, this is interesting. I, I want to throw my hat in the ring for this. And I did, I, you know, I went and interviewed and it had been a few years since I'd done traditional, you know, crime analysis, but I was offered the position and the primary responsibility was for me to implement DDAX in three small jurisdictions that were all connected. Garner was the primary agency, but it also assisted Holly Springs and Fuquay Verena. I worked a little bit with Nightdale Police Department too. So all, you know, all of these little small towns that all are right outside of Raleigh. The grant's purpose was to implement DDAX to see if we could help them with combating some of the crime in these small jurisdictions. So We've touched on DDAX on this show before, but I guess for those that maybe missed that episode or are unaware of DDAX, could you just generally go over the process? Yeah. So, uh, you know, DDAX stands for Data Driven Approaches to Crime and Traffic Safety. At the core of that philosophy is crimes are occurring at the same place that people are traveling in and out of. Usually, if you can pinpoint where you're having most of your traffic incidents, so maybe your traffic crashes, uh, you have busy intersections, and then you correlate your crime numbers with that, you're going to find some type of overlap. And if you focus your attention in those areas, you're going to help decrease the crime in your jurisdiction. Okay. And then so as you look back... You started this DDAX program locally from the ground up, 
I mean, what were some lessons learned? What were some obstacles in the beginning that you had to find workarounds for? So I had to learn DDAX. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was hired to come to just to start this, to implement this in, in the towns. But I had not been to a DDAX workshop. And, and that's what IATALYS does. They put on these amazing workshops, you know, across the country. And they're three-day, you know, you sit down and you learn everything about DDAX. And you leave that with an agency plan. And these agencies had been to the workshop and they left with the plan. And their plan was, let's hire an analyst and then they'll implement DDAX. <laughs> um, so I was at a little bit of a disadvantage. And when I was hired, Hired, they gave me some contact information for some individuals and they they gave me these names of Christopher Bruce and Deborah Peel. And I said, okay, well, I'm just going to email these people. I, I don't really know them. Um, I hadn't been super active in IACA at, up to that point. So I reached out to Christopher and he called me and, you know, of all places, he was in New Orleans. He had just gotten off of a plane and he was going to the New Orleans Police Department, I believe. And so we chatted about DDAX and he was like, hey, if, if there's any chance you can get your your agency to send you to this conference in Massachusetts, we're going to be doing a lot of DDAC stuff and I have some time that I can spend with you. So I convinced the agency to send me to MACA, the Massachusetts Crime Analysis Association Conference, which was such a good time. I enjoyed it so <laughs> much um, up in Hyannis. But I got to meet Christopher and I got to meet Deb Peel and sit down with them and Deb and I became fast friends. We're still friends today. We still talk about DDAX and work on some DDAX stuff together. But, you know, she sat down with me and really made sure I was clear on what DDAX was. And so when I came back from that conference, I was good to go. You know, we rolled it out, we implemented it, and we started having success almost immediately following that model. What did you find to be the most difficult to implement with DDAX? Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, there are studies out there and you know, I've read different things over the years. Obviously, we had a Walmart in, in the jurisdiction. And when I really laid out the numbers, you know, the crime numbers, where the most traffic stuff was happening, Walmart sat right in the middle of it. And doing my research and, you know, making some of our contacts with Walmart corporate, we found out that that particular location had a very high loss rate. I mean, it was one of the highest on the East Coast. And so that was a decision that we had to make. And that's a decision that a lot of agencies have to make when it comes to dealing with property crime, like shoplifting. Do you want to include it in your analysis or is it an anomaly? Do you want to treat it as an anomaly? And that was a decision that we had to make. And that was sort of a, a tough one because we wanted to also have an impact on our corporate partner that was there in our jurisdiction. You know, we worked very closely with the loss prevention individuals and, you know, we wanted to help them as well with this initiative. So we actually chose to keep it into the analysis and made some connections at our district attorney's office on, hey, if we really start to send the message that we won't tolerate shoplifting at these locations, will you guys help us out with sort of prosecuting that? And they did. And we were able to have an impact on shoplifting as well as everything else that was going on in that general area. Good choice to get the DA involved. Oh, absolutely. We couldn't have without their agreement to, to, yeah, let's do something. Let's not just cite and release them. Let's actually bring them down and, and process them uh, into the jail. That definitely sent a message to those frequent flyers. So what was the overall impact of DDAX to the three jurisdictions? Yeah, so, I mean, doing DDAX and it being you know, relatively new at the time, we were one of the first agencies to go through workshops and really start to implement it. But we were definitely uh, one of the only regional models of DDAX, um, if, you, if you want to call it a regional model. And being part of the DDAX team, you know, going out and, and talking with other people who were implementing DDAX, I got to see that we really were doing something kind of unique in our little corner of North Carolina. 
the result was really positive in this area. It was really positive for community relations, if nothing else. So yes, we did. We had an impact, a positive trend on, you know, driving down the crashes, identifying those problem intersections, getting things corrected, like, uh, you know, the timing cycles at, at problem intersections for the traffic lights and things like that. But I think the biggest thing that we saw was that community engagement piece increase. And that's so important, you know, particularly now with law enforcement, you want to have that positive interaction with the community. And they loved that we were being very transparent with what we were doing, that we were collaborating for three small areas that all, you know, the jurisdiction lines crossed. Um, the community really responded well to that. And we, we involved them in it. We took feedback. We put stuff on our website. We created public facing maps. Uh, we had meetings. I mean, you name it, we did it. If it was suggested in the DDAX uh, model and in the DDAX training, you know, we, we gave it a try. But for our little corner of the world, it was definitely positively received. They're still doing it. You know, I'm, I, I'm long gone, but I know that they're still doing DDAX. I know that it's still on the website. I know that they're actually hosting a, a DDAX workshop in a couple of weeks to just keep it going in this area because it has been so positively received. That's fascinating that there seems to be an understanding of the public. And <laughs> I don't mean to be skeptical on that, but it's usually when you're talking about law enforcement and you're talking about traffic stops, that's usually a more of an annoyance to the public than right. they see as a benefit. A lot of it comes down to the area that you choose to deploy the tactics in. And the area that we chose in, in these particular jurisdictions, there were citizen complaints already. Like, mm -hmm. what can you do? Why are people speeding through my neighborhood? You know, if it's a cut through from a shopping center to a fast food restaurant or something, people would speed through the neighborhood. So when, you know, when the public feels like they're being heard and law enforcement is addressing the issue that's bothering them, like that's a, a big principle of DDAX is, you know, what's the social harm? What's, what's happening here? And the social harm in one neighborhood is not necessarily the same as what it is in another neighborhood. So the, that's the beauty of the DDAX model is being able to tailor it to what the concerns are of the citizens that live and work in that area. And that's exactly what we did. And that, that's why it paid off. And that's why we got the citizen buy-in. So with the three jurisdictions, did they each have a separate plan or were, are these jurisdictions so close to one another that they had to coordinate what their plans are? Yeah, so they each they each had sort of a unique spin on their plan. Some had some cross in the area because the jurisdiction line kind of laid right there, and that was the DDAX area. But again, different cities have different little nuances about them, so we had to tweak each one to fit the need. But overall, the, the project, the success of marrying everything up across the jurisdiction's lines, it really it just worked, you know, it, it's hard to do regional analysis. And that was a new experience for me. But the way that we did it, the way that we made sure that each individual community got what they needed from the plan, it all added up to be successful. So then from here, you move on to the North Carolina Sheriff's Association as a criminal justice program manager. So what kinds of tasks did you get into there? While I was at Garner, I actually went through and I got my master's in criminal justice administration. And so, you know, coming off of the heels of new education and uh, the grant was ending, I wanted to see maybe if I wanted to do something a little bit different from traditional crime analysis. And so that opportunity uh, popped up and I was like, you know what, I'm going to give this a try. It was definitely a, a different experience. It was a learning experience for me. My role as the criminal justice programs manager was to essentially manage all of our programs that directly impacted the sheriffs in our state. And in North Carolina, we have 100 counties and each county has a sheriff. So we serve 100 sheriffs at the Sheriff's Association. And in my role, my primary program was called the Statewide Misdemeanor Confinement Program. 
and I was responsible for ensuring that all 100 counties received training on that program and how to uh, manage that population of inmates. It's a unique law in North Carolina where uh, someone that's convicted of a misdemeanor will not serve that time in a state prison. They will serve it in a local county jail. The idea is to allow them to be closer to home so that they can, you know, have visits from family. It gives them opportunities to maybe do things like work release. The main bulk of that population are those individuals convicted for driving while impaired offenses. So I managed that population. And by manage, I mean when they went through the court system, my team would place them in a local facility. So we managed that population. We knew where they were, they were going to be there. We made sure that they were close to home throughout all 100 county jails. And then I would train everyone in the state on how to process the paperwork that was required for managing that uh, population of inmates. And then we did statistics that we had to report to the General Assembly and other interested parties in the state that were, you know, interested in tracking, was this program being successful? Were we seeing an increase in misdemeanors, a, a decrease in misdemeanors and things like that? That was my main program. I also did things like manage the, the courthouse security and church security programs where a courthouse could say, hey, can you send someone out to evaluate us to make sure we don't have a risk for someone coming in, maybe with a firearm or you know, coming in and doing something in the courthouse that could jeopardize safety for individuals. So I had a, a retired law enforcement that would go out and do these assessments and we would write up reports and, and provide those and provide training. Same thing for churches. We would do that for any church in the state of North Carolina that asked. We'd send someone out to evaluate to see if there was anything that they could do to just enhance and make sure that they had had what they needed so that they could make their church population feel a little more comfortable sitting in the facilities just to give sort of that extra peace of mind that we had this report and we had evaluated it and certified that they had some good practices in place. Well, this brings us to Lexus Nexus, but before we get to that, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to get to your transition to LexisNexis and your current role today. And we're also going to take some calls. We have a new segment to the show called Shit You Hear in the Office that we're going to play for the first time. You're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Kristen Lotman. And my public service announcement is to say, Get your face out of your phone and your fingers off your keyboard and make that face-to-face -face contact because that's how you'll connect with other people. So this is Sam, and I want to let you know that it's okay to talk to strangers. Obviously not if you are four or if you're walking alone at night or in the woods. But in general, if you're just out in your day-to-day -day life or you're traveling or whatever, talk to somebody, talk to strangers. It makes you a more interesting person because it gives you more perspective on life. Everyone is walking around with an interesting story. So many people will defy your expectations when you, uh, you see someone and you make certain assumptions about them, whether they're conscious or unconscious. I love the moment when you realize you were wrong. It's a great feeling and uh, I think it makes your life richer in general. You know, if you're too shy, then Maybe just read Humans of New York. That might help you to, to understand other people's experiences. But I'm just here to say, don't not talk to strangers. Welcome back, Lauren. I want to talk now about your transition to LexisNexis. So how did you find a job of LexisNexis? So I, you know, I was at the Sheriff's Association and I was doing something different. And I realized one day that I really missed doing analysis, but I didn't know if I necessarily wanted to go back into a police department. You know, I'd done a couple of different things and I was still in this 
you know, space where I, I wanted to do something different, but I also missed my roots. And mm-hmm. I, over the years, have developed a, a friendship with uh, Susan Whitford. We met through IACA. I met her through doing some DDAC stuff. And I reached out to her one day. I sent her a message. It may have been a, a Facebook message. I, I, I honestly <laughs> remember. And I just said, hey, Susan, you know, I see what you're doing. I, she had gone to Bayer and uh, LexisNexis had recently acquired Bayer. I know you guys have Anna. I don't know everything that you do, but if you ever have an opportunity that's coming up, just let me know. Send, send me a job posting if, if you think about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't even intend for her to necessarily respond. And she called me and she was in Disney with her kids. <laughs> and she was like, I'm so glad you reached out to me. I actually posting a job in like a week or two. And I think you would be a really good candidate for it. So I said, yeah, awesome. Please send it to me. I definitely would love to take a look at it. And she did. And I did. And I went and I interviewed and here we are five years later. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. So I'm curious whether this came up in the interview or not. So in looking over your resume, you know, you have a lot of different stops, a couple of years here, a couple of years there. Was there any concern or did you get asked about not staying in one place for very long? No, you know, no one asked me that. I get it because being in a hiring role, I I look at things like that too and I question, but I, Mm -hmm. but I also understand that sometimes you go into things with really high hopes and Mm -hmm. maybe it's not exactly what you thought it was going to be. And, you know, you should never... Stay somewhere that you're just not happy. I did make some moves. You know, every move I made, I made for a a reason, uh, some of them strategic. And I just grew my career that way. And I had a lot of great experiences. Looking back, I don't think I would change any of it. Good. So then how was the transition from the public sector to the private sector for you? So that's definitely an interesting transition because I had never worked in that environment. You know, I had been in in police departments and I had been at our state bureau and I had been around police officers. This is a, a new environment where I was around business. You know, we were at business decisions, strategy, all new lingo and things that I was having to learn there was an adjustment period. You know, it takes a little bit to learn, well, exactly what does a market planner do? What What is that role and how, how do I work with that person? And then exactly what do our sales reps do and how can I enhance the work that they're doing? So just like those first days in the police department where I had to, to really learn what's the difference in what the line officer is doing versus the sergeant versus the district captain. Now I'm doing that in another environment. So I was a fish out of water for a little bit, but the great thing about LexisNexis is because we have those products and solutions that are for law enforcement customers, for our public safety customers, there are a lot of people just like me that work here. And, you know, I was able to really go to them, seek advice, and, and they helped me with the transition. So that was definitely great for me. So, you know, I had Susan as a resource, obviously, but I also had Samantha Glenn who works here, who had done the same transition. And so I could go to her and ask her questions. And then Josh Levin, same thing, able to, to use them as resources. And it definitely made the transition much smoother and easier. So you're assigned to be a fraud analyst. To this point in your career, had you dealt with much fraud? No. And, <laughs> you know, I, I'd done some white collar stuff. I had done some uh, police corruption stuff. And so the, you know, the title was senior fraud analyst and that, you know, it's more of a working title. Like that's how, mm-hmm. how we were titled in the special investigations unit as a senior fraud analyst. But I worked primarily with our federal government public safety customers. So I was still dealing with law enforcement data. I was still looking at things that I was, you know, very accustomed to looking at, but just on a larger scale, you know, doing things like batch analysis. And if you are a seasoned analyst and you've done data analysis, you can apply those same principles to any type of data. That's exactly what I was able to do. And so there was no hesitation. 
there was a little bit of a learning curve, but not much as far as looking at different elements in the data, but data is data. And so having that great experience behind me of doing data analysis, it was very easy to catch on and roll with it very quickly. So you said federal government was your client. What are, were some examples? Yeah. So, I mean, just any federal government agency that you can think of that might use, you know, one of our products like Accurate for Law Enforcement. Then you transitioned to being a manager. So how was that putting that hat on going from an analyst to then managing analyst? Yeah. So I was a manager at the Sheriff's Association. So that was my first experience of being a people leader. And then when I made the transition over into LexisNexis and I got promoted into a management role, my first management role was over our team of embedded crime analysts. And they're in, in agencies across the country working as crime analysts, you know, just like I had done all those years before. For me, it was a very natural fit because I sat in that seat before and I understood things that they would come to me with concerns, questions, and I was really able to connect with them on that analyst level. And it was definitely an easy transition into that people leader role with that team because I'm an analyst at heart and, you know, I get it and I, I didn't mind helping out and referring them to things and resources and making sure that they had what they needed. So you're managing them remotely, correct? Correct. So yeah. how is that managing remotely? Working remotely is interesting. That's a little bit of a learning curve too. I don't I don't think it's something for everyone, which I know this past year, so many people have transitioned into this <laughs> work from home mode, but I have since coming to Lexus, I've been a work from home employee, but I go visit and I think it's really important to go and spend three, four days every year, every six months if I can with them in their environment, meet the people that they're working with on a daily basis and just know that when they tell me, oh yeah, Sergeant Smith just walked into the room, like I know who they're talking about. And mm -hmm. when they are talking about something that's happening in their environment, I've been there, I've seen it. And it just, it, you know, it makes it a little bit easier, but we do a lot of team oriented things virtually, you know, we'll all have lunch together. You know, we've done some things like music trivia, like holiday trivia at Christmas time, things like that to still make sure we're all engaging as a team and, and doing some team building stuff. You know, obviously we've done a little bit more the past year because we haven't been able to get together in person, but it works. It's different, but it, it definitely works. And it's despite the distance, we are a very close knit team and in pretty constant communication. So do you require your employees to come back to DC annually? We will, we'll get together and do like a little team retreat, not necessarily DC. I know we ha we do have a, an office, a LexisNexis office in DC. That's where our government office is. And we have been there and we've had a meeting, but mm -hmm. you know, we also try to get to like the IACA conference all together as a team. And so then we have some time together, oh, you know, okay. out to dinner and stuff like that. There's no requirement for everyone to come in at certain points. I do try to organize, you know, some meetings, get us all together. We'll do some training together. Uh, maybe we'll all, you know, attend a webinar, but we do it together in the room together and do that team building activity, brainstorming and things like that. So what does your unit, the special investigations unit at LexisNexis do? Yeah. So, you know, the SIU is, it's such a great hidden gem at LexisNexis. And I think a lot of people don't realize that we're there. They don't realize what we do. And uh, when I started at LexisNexis, that's when uh, the SIU was born. So it was really great to bring together uh, so many different people from the field of law enforcement and then people that had experience working with customers in the health and human services field, as well as working with tax and regulatory type customers to form this impactful team to really help support the business. So, you know, essentially the SIU is, it's a collaborative team and, and we really, we tell stories with our data and we try to provide 
actionable insights to really help our business and also to help our customers to make informed decisions, to really optimize their resources, uh, to solve their problems and ultimately protect our communities. You know, this team has more than 20 analysts with, I don't know, 200 plus years of law enforcement experience altogether. And we have this great ability to work at that local, state, or federal law enforcement level with, you know, any of our customers, really leveraging our extensive knowledge of criminal investigations, patrol activities, intelligence analysis, just basic crime analysis, to really help our law enforcement customers solve their problems. We want to make sure that when they're using one of our products, that they're using, you know, getting everything out of it. They know all of the tips and tricks so that they can be successful in the work that they're doing. And that's what this team does. Yes, we're here to support internally our sales teams to help them do products demonstrations. We do go to conferences and we have a booth and we'll show off our products. But what we really shine at doing is that sort of customer assistance bit. People don't realize that we're here for that. And we can offer case assistance to our customers. And so they can call us up and say, hey, I'm having trouble looking at this. Can you please help me? Because we know everything about our product and we know our data inside and out, we can really leverage that to help our customers be successful. And that's what we're here to do. Uh, we're still doing analysis, still digging into cases where we can when we have that opportunity. And, you know, any, anyone that is a customer of ours, and even if you're not a customer, you can still reach out and, and, and we can see what we can do to help you. But that's what the special investigation does at its core is we help our customers. We want to make sure that they've got what they need to solve their problems. And we love being a part of that. Moving on then, you have two master's degrees and you had mentioned the wine. You went and got your master's in criminal justice, and you recently, this year, just got your MBA. So I'm, I'm kind of curious why you decided first to get the master's degree in criminal justice, and then why did you decide to then get a master's degree this year? I mean, an MBA this year. Yeah, so I haven't quite finished my MBA. I'm taking my last courses and I actually finished it in August. So okay. in August, I will officially have the MBA. But, you know, I have definitely been focused on my personal development. I'm very much a lifelong learner and I pursued the master's in criminal justice to see what other opportunities that might open up for me. And, and I feel like at the time it did, you know, that, that landed me at the Sheriff's Association where I, I tried something different. I learned a lot of things. Since coming to work at LexisNexis and being in this different environment and learning so much about how a business operates and strategy and marketing and, and all of those different things, I wanted to learn more. You know, I want to position myself to be a, a strong contributor in the business that I'm working in. COVID hit and no one was really going anywhere and doing anything. So I said, why not? I'm home. I can do this online. And so that's what I have been doing with my nights and weekends throughout COVID. I've sat down and I've, I've read a lot of books and taken a lot of courses to just work on my personal development, my career development, and to just give me a better understanding when I'm in a meeting and we're, we're really digging into strategy. You know, what does that mean? And what does that look like? And what do these financial reports mean that I'm reading and looking at? I did it for me just to give me that peace of mind, give me that broader understanding and to make me a stronger contributor into the business that I'm working for. You make me feel bad. I just created a podcast during my time. You went out <laughs> hey. and got an MBA. I mean, people ask me all the time, well, why are, how are you working full time and you're doing this? And I'm like, well, I don't sleep a lot. Um, <laughs> So I, I just, nights and weekends, not really being able to leave the house, that was what I put my energy into. And, you know, we'll see, come August, I'll, I'll finish. But I can tell you, this is it. This is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know that feeling when I was getting my master's in criminal justice. I did not want to read. To this day, I don't think I've read a textbook. I refuse to read another textbook. 
but yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely done. This is it. <laughs> All right, good deal. One of the questions I always like to ask in terms of our advice section is return on investment. So, for our listeners, there, what would you suggest that an analyst learn today? Because in five years from now, let's say it, it's going to be important, and it will give them a good return on their investment of time. So there's a book that I've read that I really enjoy, and it's called To Sell as Human. It's written by Daniel Pink, and it's all about being authentic, like learning how to sell yourself. And I think that's really important, you know, learning how to speak to different groups, uh, to do a little bit of self-promotion, but, you know, really being an authentic person, true to yourself, and taking that into everything that you do examining that a little bit, spending a little bit of time of, on, on yourself. Uh, I highly recommend that book. It's, a, it's not a bad read. It's not a textbooky type thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a really good book that makes you think about how can I learn to position myself maybe a little bit differently if, if I'm not being successful and I'm not quite sure why. I, I definitely would recommend that book. All right. That sounds good because analysts certainly need to work on self-promotion. That's yeah. one thing I think this profession really struggles with. Yeah. So you have been in the profession now for 20 years. And so looking back, what is something that the law enforcement analyst position is still struggling with when you would have thought when you began your career 20 years ago, I was like, oh, they'll have it figured out by 2021. And yet we're still struggling with it. Right. I still don't understand why there is a hesitancy to share. I think it's so important. I think that sharing data, it's just important. People are mobile. People are moving. They're going all kinds of places and contributing your data to contributory databases like, you know, the Accurate Virtual Crime Center that we sell, sharing and helping one another as criminals cross jurisdiction lines. You know, we do it when it's a, it's a big case, but there's still people want to hold things close and they, and they don't necessarily want to share. And I really thought that by now that would have gotten better and it's definitely improved, but I really hope that it continues to improve and that more, more agencies become open and, and share and want to help one another because we're all after the same thing. We're all fighting the same mission. Very good. So we have a new segment to the show. It's a call-in segment. It's called Shit You Hear in the Office. It's similar to Favorite First Jobs or Don't Be That Analyst. And where this idea came from is I was talking with an analyst and the person wants to remain anonymous, as you'll probably understand here in a second. And the analyst was telling me last summer that a sergeant in the office was talking and he said that in August of 2019, he got COVID and that was because the Chinese were testing out COVID as a weapon in their small town and he got it then. And he was dead serious. I heard that and I said, that is some crazy shit. So it got me thinking about my time in different offices. And so I wanted to ask the audience then, what is some shit that you've heard in the office? It's some just really crazy stories. Do you have any crazy stories that you heard in the office? You know, I'm sure that there are so many that I can't even... I can't even begin, you know, I mean, there's just so much stuff that happens in a police department that you're just like, what? You know, some of my favorite things that have happened have been more so like what I've read in a report, like, you know, I'd come in for the day and I'd read and we'd have things where, you know, I couldn't believe they would get through and get a approved. Like someone was trying to spell the word um, buttocks one time, like to describe something, B-U-T-T-O-C-K-S. And they described it B-U-T-T-O-X, like butt ox. And I'm like, <laughs> like Botox. <laughs> yeah. Um, where did, wh what science book did you read that in? So, you know, it just, there's been so much stuff over the years. I don't even know what I can drag up out of the back of my mind. <laughs> Nice, nice. All right, so we got a couple of callers on the line, and uh, so we're going to see how this goes. So our first caller is Eurissa. Eurissa, what is some shit that you heard in the office? 
So one of the most, I, and I thought it was hysterical, probably it isn't, but one of the funniest thing I heard is somebody saying, yeah, guess what, you know, I, I just walked to the, inside the branch and I was wearing glove and, and a mask, uh, you know, due to COVID-19. And obviously this is kind of like a forbidden type of thing in the bank, but due to the environment, I thought that it, it was kind of funny that we now are forced to work into a branch with a mask and glove. To me, that was funny. It might not be for everyone else. <laughs> yeah, I did, I feel the same way, especially with the kids. I'm like, we're getting out of the car and I say, hey kids, put your masks on, especially to go into a bank now. It's crazy <laughs> to think about. I, I actually can't believe, and I haven't looked at the numbers, I actually can't believe there hasn't been more bank robberies, right? If you're going in there and you have to wear a mask already, Right. It seems to me that that would be easier for the folks to rob the banks. I, I know when I was in Cincinnati, they had a program where they were starting to work with the banks where they would ask people standing in line if they could remove sunglasses, hats, hoodies, so they could make sure they could get a, a good identity or at least see folks that were standing in line. And that helped curve a lot of bank robberies. So now that you have to go in there and wear a mask, it just seems to me that bank robberies should be on the rise. Yeah, no, it's, we're living in an interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next caller is Danell. Danell, what is some shit that you've heard in the office? Some shit I've heard in the office is when we, suggest that a, a criminal is responsible for certain sets of crimes and these criminals get arrested for that specific crime and the detective says no no they don't do that they only do this kind of crime that's kind of interesting i i think uh criminals are free to do whatever crime they feel like they wanted to commit don't you think right yeah i, don't, I, I didn't realize that they were only allowed to commit one type of crime but you know hey <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the officer must have really thought they knew him well. They threw him for a loop. All right, so next on the line is Noah. Noah, what's some shit that you heard in the office? Well, one of my favorite stories uh, working at Tempe PD, uh, and it, it really speaks to how policing has changed, was an assistant chief uh, early on in my career told a story about he was sitting at his desk cleaning his weapon, having a conversation with somebody, and he accidentally fired the gun, it, and it went through the ceiling of his office. Today, if you did that, you'd probably get fired or it would be on the, you know, the, the six o'clock news. Um, but he kept his job. Of course, he was an assistant chief. But what, what, to, to think about how policing has changed over the years, and, and he tells that casually about making that kind of big mistake in, in the police building and whole, keeping your job, I'd like to think we can recover from, from bad decisions that we make on the job as, as analysts. I, yeah, I can't imagine. I, I, I'm actually surprised back then that he kept his job, to be honest with you. I mean, that I would have thought that would that still would have made the news. But today, no, absolutely not. I think there would be no way that you could keep your job today. No, probably not. For some reason, I can I visualize this guy at his desk with his feet up, just randomly talking to a person like cleaning a six shooter <laughs> and, and it going off. That's what, when he's telling that story, that's what I visualize. No, I, I can, I can see that. And you, know, you just think about some of the, the stuff that happens in a police department and it's, I don't think it's any big deal for someone to be cleaning their weapon, but I know in our police department, we had those little boxes that they had to stick their weapon in and, and make sure they emptied the round. Um, if they were going to do something like that. So maybe that's why those are now a thing and that a lot of police departments have them just in case you had an accidental discharge. Yeah, no, I, I can't imagine if you worked above him and then you <laughs> shot up through the floor. Oh, man. All right, next on the line is Jeffrey. Jeffrey, what's some shit that you heard in the office? Okay. So starting off in uh, my career in law enforcement, I was in the office and I heard somebody say to somebody else, hey, LT, how you doing today? I'm like, well, that's kind of an interesting name. Never heard somebody named LT before. So go on. And then the next day I hear somebody else ask somebody else, hey, LT, got a question. So I'm like hearing, like, I, I can't believe all these people are named LT. So I asked somebody, you know, 
can you believe like all these people are named LT and then they start laughing and laughing because you know they're t talking to a lieutenant mm -hmm. and they the uh, the 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 abbreviation was LT and here I am thinking that half the department was named LT that's some newbie stuff there. You grew up in a police family, so probably LT was probably natural to you, right? Yeah, that would never happen to me. So now yeah. I'm not quite understanding some things I, I get, but that, that one I didn't experience. Yeah, that, that had to be uh, embarrassing to have to say, well, what's LT stand for? Right. Right. <laughs> All right. Very good. And Okay. And our last one is from Mayor. Mayor. What's some shit that you heard in the office? Well, maybe not something I hear in the office, but something I saw in the office. So while I was working um, at a task force, I was monitoring a phone, a GPS phone ping, monitoring a GPS tracker, and I was on the radio, very tactical, with the officers uh, that were on the street. And they were doing a follow on the subject. And one of the officers called me up and on my cell and said, hey, Mayor, take a look out the window. He said, do you watch diners, drive-ins, and dives? And I said, oh, with uh, Guy Fieri? I said, yeah, I do. I've, I've seen it before. He said, look out the window. So I looked out the window, and sure enough, there is Guy Fieri with his red, you know, convertible with his shorts, and it's mid-November. I mean, it's freezing in Minneapolis. So <laughs> there he is with his white hair and sunglasses. They were filming at Nice Polonaise Room. Uh, it's a restaurant that was across the street from our task, task force. So that was that was great to see that. That's interesting. Are you familiar with the show? I am. I am. And his <laughs> spiky hair, eating at some of the restaurants he likes to visit. I'll, that's a go-to for me. But that, that would be pretty cool to, to look out your window and see that. Yeah, I, I think don't, I don't understand shorts in November in, in, in <laughs> Minneapolis, but <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's hot blooded or whatever. Maybe he just never wears pants. But uh, it's interesting. Uh, just on a side note, I recently saw some top 10 things that you didn't know about the show. And so some interesting things were you don't meet him in advance. The restaurant doesn't get to pick the items that are on the show, that restaurant has to pay a fee to be on the show. And he does not like eggs. So none of the stuff that he tries will have eggs in it. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So that's shit that you hear in the office. And if you have something crazy that you've heard in the office and you want to share it with the show, email me at leapodcasts at gmail.com. All right, Lauren, personal interest. And I wanted to talk to you about your personal interest. You are a golfer. Uh, you would call it golfer, <laughs> a version of golf. <laughs> so what's your handicap? Um, I, I currently don't have one. <laughs> I've taken a little bit of time off the past couple of years, and I've just recently started picking the clubs back up. And, and playing so I'm working on reestablishing that handicap with the you know my husband and I went to Scotland and Ireland in 2018 and uh, we went to the open and and he played and I didn't wow. I toured castles and and did you know fun stuff and he he played golf but we want to go back hopefully in 20 2022 and I want to play this time so wow. um We'll see if that works out. <laughs> All right. So did you ever have a handicap? I did at one point, and it, it's not awesome. I, maybe <laughs> I was like a 16 or a 17. Yeah. I'm not I'm not a good golfer. But I also don't take it seriously. Like for me, it's just something fun and that, you know, he and I can do together. And, and I have a couple of girlfriends that play and we'll go out. But I'm not, a you know, a, a hyper competitive golfer. I just enjoy wasting you know four or five hours playing around a golf yeah i'm not a very good golfer either and i had played less and less over the years but you know when i was in my 20s and even in my 30s it was just something that i enjoyed doing outside yeah so i had an office job in which i was indoors eight plus hours a day most of the time and then this was just an opportunity to be outside to do something absolutely yeah. yeah, but it's interesting. I'm not, like, thinking back now, a lot of people 
picked up golf last year because that was one of the few activities you could do right. in the lockdown. So yeah. you could have chose to, you know, work on your handicap instead of doing something impressive, like get an MBA. <laughs> I mean, maybe that that's what I, I should have put my focus into, but you know, we'll, we'll finish up the MBA in August and then we'll get on that handicap and see if we can get oh, it down. To six digits. Maybe, maybe work on getting the card in the LPGA. Oh, yeah, yeah, wait. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then on a more serious note, you are a breast cancer survivor. So glad you're back and healthy. Just what are your thoughts from beginning to end as you look back? Um, I mean, you know, you know, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I have a lot of thoughts, (laughs) but you know, probably the biggest thing that I learned throughout this journey is listen to yourself, listen to your body, you know, when something's wrong and be your own advocate. You have to do that. And, you know, for women, you know, breast cancer, it, you know, one in eight, it affects women. And we are encouraged to wait later in life to have some of the initial screenings. And I was discouraged when I said something's wrong, uh, that I was told I was too young. I I didn't need it. And I fought for it. And had I not fought for getting the, you know, getting the mammogram, getting the testing, we would have never found it. And I would not be where I am today. So be your own advocate. You have to. And and if you don't feel comfortable with a provider or a doctor, then I recommend getting a second opinion. I I will echo that. My mom, uh, she's historically been called a hypochondriac all of her life, but she uh, had breast cancer and they found it very, very early and it was able to be treated and taken care of. The doctor did say because she found it so early was the main reason she was able to recover. So listen to your body, I think is a very good piece of advice as well. So very good. All right, so our last segment of the show is Words to the World. And this is where I give the guests the last word. Lauren, you can promote any idea that you wish. What are your words to the world? You know, so I think I, I kind of have two maybe. Uh, my first one is more of don't let someone telling you no end your pursuit of, you know, achieving a goal or your happiness. Keep climbing, you know, let that no light your fire. Let that no drive you somewhere. Don't be discouraged. It's very easy to hear no, hit a roadblock and, and pack it up and say, all right, I'm done. You know, find another way. Keep going, keep pursuing, you know, go back, get that master's degree, look for another job opportunity, whatever that goal is. Don't let a no uh, in your pursuit. And then kind of what I already touched on, you know, don't neglect yourself. There's only one you. It's really important for you to take time out, be with your friends, be with your family. It's okay to take a day off and, you know, not check your email Self-care is super important, and I think we neglect ourselves in that way way too much. Working, being on call, responding to emails, answering the phone. Make sure you take care of yourself. It's very important, and you don't want to look back when you're older and and, and wish that you'd taken that day off and done something with your husband or your kids. So take care of you. Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you. have given me just enough to talk bad about you later. (laughs) But I do appreciate you being on the show, Lauren. Thank you so much and you be safe. No, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.